Hi, uh, welcome uh, everybody. We're going to get started in a few uh, minutes. Uh, my name is Am Johal. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement and uh, delighted to have Leif Hall uh, back with us here in the World Arts Center. This was actually a room in which she performed uh, with the Myths, uh, their electronic uh, opera about three years ago and we're in Studio D uh, afterwards. I just wanted to begin by uh, acknowledging that we're on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, the Squamish, uh, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, the topic uh, tonight, uh, mythology, gender, and cyber virtual identity in pop music performance, going to be a performance lecture by Leif Hall. For those of you who haven't uh, seen Leif before, she's a composer, singer-songwriter, director, choreographer, and creator of opera, musical theater, video, and installation. She was previously the vocalist for the Vancouver No Wave punk band Mutators, 2007, a vocalist for the imp improvisational trio Glaciers in 2009, and one half of the Canadian femme noir pop duo Myths uh, in 2012. Her most, most recent EP, Transform, in 2015 marks a new direction in her solo musical work, creating dark electronic pop, which merges the experimental dance music with layered vocal harmonies, exploring themes of love, identity, and fear in a post-human world. She's performed her solo music alongside artists such as Bear in Heaven. Inga Copeland was named on Enemy's list of 50 brand new artists set to storm in 2015. Uh, she got her BFA uh, in 2005 at Emily Carr University and since has presented work at Vivo Media Arts Center here at SFU, the Orr Gallery, Vancouver Art Gallery, and 221A uh, Gallery. She's been working as a visual production designer since 2011 and has created and collaborated with such bands as Grimes, The Bell Game, and Hannah and Georgia. I ask you to join me uh, in welcoming Leif Hall. <clears throat> some effects. Um, thank you all for being here. I really uh, am excited to oh, hi, um, be here with all of my friends and uh, in a space that I've done so many things in and also to have the opportunity to share this lecture in a more fully realized um, version. So I've been on tour um, for the past couple months sort of a slow tour, taking my time in different cities and doing, uh, presenting my uh, EP alongside this series of lectures. And um, the lecture is really a sort of ongoing dialogue where um, as, I, as I continue, I continue to like add new things and learn and at the end of each uh, lecture, there's a Q&A period and I definitely invite different ideas. Um, because it's really, I, I think of this project really about kind of a shared dialogue, and I'm really interested in this idea of academia as something which is constantly evolving through uh, participation. So um, not so much as a dogmatic sort of form, but more just as a form of sharing ideas. Um, so yeah, if you have any thoughts, I invite you to um, just remember them and we can have a discussion about them at the end of the lecture. So I, I first became really interested in um, the idea of pop mythology in about 2009. And um, the reason was because I started clubbing a lot again. <laughs> And I hadn't been for a long time. I was sort of more into experimental music. And then I w entered back into this pop music scene after a while. And at the exact same time in my life, which is, uh, doesn't really make a lot of sense, but I, I was getting really into feminist literature. So the two things uh, obviously had some conflict for me because on the one hand, I was feeling this really this sense of community through going out and dancing with friends. And as a, I really felt it was this kind of ritual. And even in the sense that um, people, you know, they kind of lose themselves. They go into altered states, often through drugs and alcohol. And, um, and it's this form of community. But at the same time, the ideas, the sort of mythology behind this um, communal ritual uh, really is at odds with a lot of people's 
belief systems, mine for sure, and also a lot of my friends who I was going out dancing with who were feminists and politi political activists, but really intelligent people. But once you get into this club environment, it's all that sort of goes to the side because you can't really have this critical discussion in the club. It doesn't work. I've tried it. It's not fun. Um, so it just sort of, and to me that really showed like the power of this form, that it's something that really takes over your body. It's something that you embody these ideas. And so I became really interested in sort of disrupting this form and seeing if I could um, enter in new ideas, new perspectives uh, from a feminist uh, viewpoint and um, bring those in to create this kind of like ritualistic space. Uh, if some of you know my past project, Myths, that was really what that project was about. Um, but I've actually, I've always really felt this kind of um, connection to ritual through music. And I think one of the reasons is because for myself, um, it was the first art form that I really felt uh, moving through me. Before that, I was a visual artist, and I, I felt like it was a very cognitive kind of practice. It was about skill and um, and really thinking about uh, the form on paper or in painting. But with music, I really felt it was just something that flowed through me that came naturally, that um, almost like a kind of communication with spirits. Um, and Joseph Campbell, who's one of the uh, leading scholars, or was one of the leading scholars on mythology, um, he died in 1987, but his, still his work is some of the most groundbreaking work in mythology and uh, comparative religion. And he talks about uh, the artist being the new myth maker in our society. So where once we had shamans, now we have artists that take what's in the environment and reinterpret it. And the original role of the shaman was kind of someone that would communicate with the spirit world and who would undergo this kind of death and resurrection in order to have this sort of connection. And as the new, as, and as we became like less metaphys metaphysical within our society, hello, <laughs> um, we, there was a push away from this idea. And the push happened slowly. So. Um, it began first in Greek, in ancient Greece, with um, this notion of the nine muses, which uh, were these spirits that were the spirits of the arts, of creativity, and the sciences. And they and artists would call upon the nine muses, and they would come to them, and they would endow them with this gift, which sometimes would show up, and sometimes it wouldn't. It just really depended on what the goddesses chose, and they were they were the daughters of Zeus. Um, and as society progressed, we're going to jump way ahead to the 1950s, uh, when we have the idea, this notion of the independent artists um, as genius. And so it's no longer this sort of communication with the gods. Now it's um, you as an individual working hard and being brilliant and being white and being male which is kind of a given at that time. Um, so, and actually it's really interesting because it began as a conspiracy, conspiracy theory, this idea that, oh, the FBI, you know, they're promoting uh, abstract, abstract expressionism as a form of uh, the promotion of capitalism during the Cold War throughout the world. But actually later documents, they went ahead and shared that yes, this was actually true. There was a whole, uh, operation around bringing abstract expressionism to the forefront in the art world on a global level as a way to promote capitalism. So we see this kind of move from the myth makers where once we sort of think of them as connected to the spirit world and the divine, we see this move of them really having this uh, connection to an ideological kind of um, position or purpose. and. Um, now we see the evolution of that with a new kind of artist, which is the corporate artist, which is essentially uh, the brand. So 
we see branding in all kinds of different areas of industry, per person branding, but um, it really came early on in the music industry. And as you can see, this is my sort of example of the move from the Nine Muses, and this is a pop band known as the Nine Muses. And so you can kind of see how uh, they're being used to sell products. They are being used as sort of representing these uh, sexual ideals of women. And they're really representations. So where the original muses sort of embodied the arts, embodied creativity, they're more like a picture that represents a set of ideas which are really dictated by a corporate entity. Um, So uh, Joseph Campbell talks about the functions of myth. And there's four primary functions. And the first function is um, to realize the dimension of mystery in all things, in all forms. Uh, the second aspect is the cosmological aspect, which is to see this divinity manifested through all forms. And the third is a sociological function, which is basically establishing um, and maintaining, validating a certain kind of society. And the fourth is the pedagogical function, which is how to live a human life under any circumstances. And so we see in this corporate world that really um, it's primarily uh, concerned with this third function, the sociological function, which is to validate and maintain a certain uh, ideological system, namely, uh, patriarchal capitalism, and um, it's uh, the other aspects draw you in, they seduce you, the uh, fantasy and the divine, all these sort of things that we crave that are more linked to a spiritual aspect of ourselves that we're looking for, but in this world we really see these as tools to promote uh, the sale of products and to promote really specific gender roles. Um, and there's, this industry is really uh, closed. It's very secretive. So there's this kind of line that is a very blurry line where we don't know, is this artist making this image themselves? Are they making this song themselves? Did they write it? Did they produce it? What's going on? Who did this? And there's a reason why it exists in that way, and it's because the industry doesn't really want you to know. They want you to feel connected to this artist as a person, but essentially this artist is a brand. And um, a really amazing book just came out a few years back by uh, this author named Kristen Lieb, and it's called Gender Branding and the Modern Music Industry, and I really highly suggest it, if you're interested in this topic, to read it, because she is a marketing executive who worked in the business with the top labels in the world for 10 years or more, and she... Uh, decided to use this knowledge, her experience, to leave the industry and become a feminist academic, which is so cool. And um, so this book really blew me away and it reveals um, all the sort of system and the language within the industry. Um, and she has uh, interviews with different people from the industry and a lot of them have to stay secret because they could lose their jobs. But, and some of them are open about it, but what they say um, about women as how they're branded in the industry is, first of all, they're considered short-term brands. So we have men who are also brands, but they're considered long-term because they can grow into old age. And they're not branded and marketed in a really specific way as women are. They're more taken as, oh, what is the male artist personality? Uh, what, how, what do we want to sell? What do they want to sell? Like, who is this individual? And how do we market them? But women have a very specific life cycle. So they start stage one as the good girl. Stage two is the temptress. And stage three, they're able to move into a number of different categories, including the diva, the whore, the exotic, the provocateur, the hot mess, or they leave the industry. So you can see right away that these, the language itself is really archetypal. The good girl is sort of representing you know, the virgin. 
and then she moves into the temptress, which in mythology is always one of the stages as the hero that you have to overcome, to surpass. She tries to lure you in. Um, and then stage three, we see the diva could be related to the divine feminine. Uh, the hot, uh, but then we move into some areas that are their own thing, hot mess. So hot mess, a good example, say Britney Spears in her darkest days. This is someone who primarily exists for entertainment, to draw you in by their own self-destruction. So, or the exotic, which is um, basically anyone who's not white in the industry. Um, the provocateur, which is someone, say, similar to Lady Gaga, who really uh, has a lot of shock value. Um, and the whore, which uh, usually is the end of the person's career after this phase, who we would see someone like Christina Aguilera, um, just when she w when she first left the industry, um, and it's really a it's really a marketing tactic. So a lot of these artists don't have a choice where they want to go. Some of them more than others. It's really again the lines really blurry, but it kind of gives you an idea how there is. It's not just um, speculative. It's not just looking at the industry and saying, "Hey, this seems really archetypal. This seems like a sort of." Um, really uh, falsified image of a person, but actually they're really thought, thought through in terms of like the function in, in our society. And one way that um, the industry is kept in this archetypal sort of mode with these specific artists is through gatekeeping, which as Christine Lee uh, says, it's the process of taking billions of messages we get each day and then transforming them into hundreds of messages that reach each given person per day. Um, and so we have this idea with um, modern technology and social media that it's very easy for independent artists to break through, but in fact, it's very difficult because um, these gatekeepers also are presidents, vice presidents, A&R representatives of labels, um, publicists, journalists, music critics, chart managers, and merchandisers. Um, and it's largely white male dominated, and they're looking for really specific things in artists that they find marketable without wanting to take a lot of chances on new identities. So that's a bit of the sort of um, uh, background information that I want to just begin with for this talk, just so you have an idea of how the industry is functioning. Um, but what I'm really interested in talking about today is some new identities that have um, begun to emerge which integrate new technologies. And I think it's really fascinating to look at the music industry to sort of see the direction that our society is going because the music industry has this really unique ability to integrate new technology and new economies because it's a very fluid structure. Um, you can think of when social media first hit the scene, the music industry was one of the first industries to absorb this and use it as a tool. Uh, the same with the di digitization of music. Um, and Jack Attili, who wrote this book, uh, Noise, the Political Economy of Music, talks about this as almost... Um, as music being something that can almost read the future. You can sort of see the future of a society. He goes through the history of music and how in different cultures you can see the cultural shift, especially around times when there's major shifts in technology. And this might be because the, dom the powers that be at the time use music as a tool, as they have historically. The church used the music, music as a tool. It's a very... Um, uh, great source of propaganda, or you could see it just that it does have this quality of sort of being at the cutting edge of thought, and it really integrates thought immediately. So we can look at what's happening in music and perhaps see a glimpse into what might be these sort of worlds to come. Um, the archetypes that I've noticed emerging, I'm calling them cyber virtual identities. And cyber uh, is in reference to the cyborg or cybernetic organism. 
in terms of Donna Haraway's notion of the cyborg as a kind of disassembled and reassembled postmodern collective and personal self, as a creature of social reality as well as a creature of science fiction. And the virtual is in reference to computer software and technology. And whether in live music performance, music videos, or pictures, these identities merge the body with technology to create a body which exists in a virtual landscape. So again, it's a being of science fiction and a technologically altered body. The cyber virtual identity cannot exist as a being within our world, but exists within a constructed and mythic media world. So I'd like to begin our exploration of these identities uh, in space. So as we enter into space and the mythology of science fiction, uh, we could see very clearly that this manifestation of mythology within our society makes a lot of sense. 
because as a society, our kind of rejection of the metaphysical world makes it difficult for us to integrate imagination and gods and other worlds into our everyday landscape. And Carl Jung, who was really interested in the psyche and how you and how one integrates mythology, he really talks about how the psyche has evolved with mythology and through mythology and that it's deeply ingrained as in, within us as human beings and that no matter what our belief system is, that we can't actually escape mythology. He wrote a paper uh, called Flying Saucers, a Modern Myth. And in this, he talks about how mythology has come to our society in the form of the flying saucer. And he describes these, this phenomenon as uh, living myths. So these are myths which um, is essentially a legend in the process of consolidation. So it is evolving with us at this current time. It is in our community right now. Um, he talks about how these uh, flying saucers can be um, subjected to the same kind of principles of dream interpretation. And that when we look at this idea of the round object, whether it be a disc or a sphere, it's really an analogy of uh, the symbol of totality, which is the mandala, which is Sanskrit for the circle. He says, it, appear, it reappears time and again, independently of trend, tradition in modern individuals, as the productive or protective and apotropic circle or alchemical microcosm, or a modern symbol of order which organizes and embraces the psychic totality. This symbol, by reason of its antiquity, leads us to the heavenly spheres, to Plato's supracelestial place where ideas of all things are stored up. Hence, there would be nothing against the naive interpretation of UFOs as souls. And as we look at how this uh, living myth has been growing within our society, we can see a lot has happened since the time that uh, Young wrote that in 1979. And today, we have all kinds of mythologies about aliens. Um, for example, that they are living among us, that they are politicians, that they are celebrities, um, that they've come to save us, all kinds of things. But in pop music, we also find the mythology of the alien. And this mythology really uh, shows us what could be within this system, within this mythology of patriarchal capitalism, what could be with our experience of new worlds. And we can see this first in Nicki Minaj's Starship video, where uh, local tribes people are calling to the gods to bring down this heavenly body. And it comes and it appears, and as you've probably seen already, it is a beautiful green-haired babe in a bikini. So this really, this idea kind of reduces the possibility of what could be in space, our new mythology. Where, what could other beings from other planets, what can they bring us, what new ideas? But actually, within this sort of mythic landscape, only one sort of uh, ideological system exists, and one gender system exists, and it continues to per perpetuate itself no matter what world it comes from. And we can see this again in uh, the Britney Spears music video called Pretty Girls. And she's sitting by her swimming pool and Iggy Azalea appears. And this is um, a really beautiful representation of sort of the patriarchal capitalist uh, space scene where the alien comes to learn how to 
be a human and Britney Spears teaches her. So they have a great time riding around in the Jeep. And essentially, the song's message is that if you're pretty, you get things for free. All the boys love you. They honk their horn at you. You don't have to wait in line. And it's obviously a parody. But the interesting thing about the sort of postmodern landscape of pop music and mythology is that while it is a parody and we laugh, at the same time it continues to perpetuate these images and we continue to embody them within our subconscious. And you can see another great function of being a superpower alien is that you can get cash from the cash machine and you can dance in it as it floats up across you. I'm just gonna play you what they're saying here. Hi, girls. Hey, B. Who's the new hottie? Yeah, she looks like totally far out. She is. She's like totally from another planet. Total. No way. This phone is totally broken. It's I a bit can out totally of fix it for you. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Those are radical alien powers. Yeah. Let me call your friend. Okay. Totally. Hello, girls. We're like totally like sadly coming over right now. Let's go. <laughs> so that gives you a little dose of that world. And now we'll have a look at Ariana Grande as she does her space striptease for us. And once again, we see the beautiful possibilities of life in space, where now your stripper can be anti-gravity. And a really interesting thing within this mythology, every mythology has its sort of creation and uh, destruction, sort of creation, end of the world, beginning of the world kind of story. And we see this happen a lot in pop music as well now, um, the sort of glamorization of the end of the world. And this is again Ariana Grande as she kisses her lover goodbye and watches the end of the world like fireworks. And um, it's really interesting thinking about what are the ideas behind what's being said to us? What's the purpose of this? So we're in this really um, sort of key moment in our history where we can either continue on the same path we've been going, continue in this sort of capitalist mind frame and accelerate and do more and more and perhaps lead ourselves to the apocalypse, which is very likely, or perhaps go into space and form new communities um, with the same exact kind of ideology, ideological system in space. So these are some of our current possibilities. And while it sounds like science fiction, these are realities that we're facing right now. And this is something that the system at large really needs to address and really needs us to sort of uh, have a certain perception about things. So if we see the apocalypse as something which can exist and it's okay to exist and we can get used to this notion of the apocalypse. We can get used to this notion of continuing capitalism until we destroy the planet. Um, and another example of this end of the world myth um, is here Katy Perry's video where we see the end of the world and Right at the end of the world, 
we have a little bit of product placement, which uh, you can just wait for it here. It's, it's really nice. There's Kanye in space. And there's your little product placement, because at the end of the world, you know, you're going to need your sunglasses. It's going to be bright. So think about it. Think about getting some. And there we go. And all these videos, you know, you can pick them apart, each one on its own. They're very rich in this sort of mythological symbolism. But we'll move on for now. And uh, this is Space Barbie. Um, if you haven't already seen her, she's a really fascinating person. And um, basically, the reason why I wanted to bring Space Barbie into it, um, well, her real name is not Space Barbie. Her real name is uh, Valeria Lukyanova. And um, she's a Ukrainian woman who is a model and uh, entertainer. Um, but she describes herself as not a real girl at all, but a time-traveling spiritual guru whose purpose is to save the world from the clutches of superficiality and negative energy. And she explains that she came to Earth to help people to realize that it is necessary to move from the role of human consumer to human demigod. And looking like Barbie, she says, is just to make non-aliens, aka humans, more inclined to hear her message. And it's a really interesting sort of um, uh, dynamic between she wants us to overcome super superficiality and yet she is embodying superficiality in order to give us this message. And as we see this sort of evolution of mythology within our culture, it becomes something which permeates not only pop music and corporate sort of entities, but it also becomes something which we embody. Because if there's a rejection of things which are unreal, what is more real than yourself? And so this sort of embodiment of this mythology or these archetypal figures is one sort of manifestation, uh, possible manifestation of these archetypes. And I'm going to move on to the next uh, sort of archetypal category. And uh, I'm going to play you one of my songs, which really um, inspired this idea about, um, about these different sort of archetypal genres. And the reason why it inspired this was because I was really at the time feeling this sense that um, I was looking at myself from the outside. And I'd been spending a lot of time on the computer and as an artist and as a musician uh, working on you know, uh, photographs and sort of my image and sort of thinking about my direction that I wanted to go and really feeling this sense of disembodiment and really seeing myself as a kind of media image. And I think this is something that we all really experience a lot because we do live part of our, li our life online and we do project a part of ourself into the media image. And so I'm going to share this with you, and then we will move on to this notion of the cartoon. Sorry, just a minute here. Thank you. 
So the cartoon, it's very effective. So we see this reoccurring image of this sort of technologically altered body within the media landscape that is the cartoon with, as you can see, the big eyes and the sort of innocent look. And how this manif manifests itself in the sort of Western society is through this kind of infantilization of sexuality. Um, the innocent, the victim, or simply the uh, trivialization of sexuality. And this is Lady Gaga and also Nicki Minaj. Um, and as Naomi Wolf points out in her book, The Beauty Myth from 1991, for the first time in history, children are growing up with their earliest sexual imprinting deriving not from living human beings or fantasies of their own. Since the 1960s pornographic upsurge, the sexuality of children has begun to, shape, to be shaped in response to the cues that are no longer human. Nothing comfortable has ever happened in the Nothing comparable has ever happened in the history of our species, and it dislodges Freud. Um, as the author and filmmaker Jean Kilborn points out, this has far more to do with the trivialization of sex, of sex than with promoting it. The problem is not that it is sinful, but that it is synthetic and cynical. We are offered a sadosexuality that makes it far more difficult to discover our own unique and authentic sexuality. So that's one way this manifests. But another is just to, in terms of our own identity, how we perceive ourselves, um, how we experience our own uh, emotions. So if we see ourselves as cartoons, if we see ourselves as these sort of media images, uh, then we objectify ourselves. And this sort of self-objectification is something that really uh, is running rampant within our culture today. One of the functions of the cartoon is to appeal to youth culture. And the mythology that happens within this landscape is something that is learned from a very young age. So this is Katy Perry, and this is her Super Bowl performance. And uh, another way that this is manifesting is through the image of the Barbie, which is a, sort of an age-old uh, tale. Well, not age-old, but certainly um, was problematic uh, in the 70s and 80s feminism and continues to be problematic now within popular culture and the image of Barbie reoccurring. Um, and the thing that's interesting is that it's not 
so much that it's bad to create these fantasies or that it's bad to sort of indulge in these fantasies or even in beauty, but it's just that it's all externalized, that there's nothing about the internal. And I think that that's really something that's um, lacking within this mythology. And in Japan, uh, we have the manifestation of the cartoon as um, uh, kawaii culture. And this is uh, Kiari Piamu Piamu. And this uh, is her live video of candy, 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 candy. And uh, one reason why this um, really is able to, uh, I'll play you a little bit of the music here. One of the reasons why this is really able to exist in this sort of corporate pop landscape is because it's a perfect sort of sales, uh, sales item. So she has the song about candy, and then of course she is also able to promote it through her different videos and promote special products, which we will see here. Oh, here in her commercial for candy. And also in a commercial for KFC. And so it's very, uh, very closely uh, related with sales. And we again see this sort of embodiment of this culture within the fashion in Japan, uh, the kawaii fashion, and we have uh, Lolita and sweet Lolita fashion. And finally, and I'm going to move through this last um, pop identity quickly as well. Uh, this is uh, Hatsune Miku. And she is a very unique cartoon because she is actually a virtual pop star. And she's a software that uh, was developed, uh, a Vocaloid software, so you can program a voice into your computer for music or for talking, for speech. And, uh, but she was such a hit as a character that she became a pop star in her own right. We can see here her performing, and she performs as a hologram. And she, one of the reasons why she's really able to function as a sort of uh, futuristic vision of the pop star is because she can be every archetype at once and go back and forth. Because she's not human, so she doesn't have a specific identity. So she can be a sexual fantasy, um, or she can be the most innocent thing in the world. And she's an open source software, so you can, um, once you have her voice, you can just download um, animation, and you can create her as however you desire. And, it's, uh, and she's also great for sponsorship because basically she doesn't need any money herself. Obviously, she's a construction. And so um, she, can be, she can just earn complete profit. And we'll see here. Um, uh, can you lower the lights a little bit so they can see the screen a bit better? Thanks. Um, so this is a Toyota commercial. And... Uh, she's able to sell the car. And we also see the embodiment of her in this um, makeup tutorial to become Hatsune Miku. And the really th interesting thing about this particular makeup tutorial to me is that it is uh, directly derived from the actual Toyota commercial. So it's not only an embodiment of this identity, but it's also an embodiment of sponsor, sponsorship of a product. And so if we think about this kind of 
future of pop stars, the future of music, what we're really seeing is someone who, while she's amazing and creative and dynamic, she's also completely externalized. She has no soul, she has no substance, and she has no personal vis vision or personal creativity. And yet, she's a technology which is there to be shaped. So that can be shaped through corporations and through people. So it does offer some sort of input into the possibilities of what could be. And so some artists that I think are really doing amazing things on the other end who are existing outside of this patriarchal, corporate, um, and capitalistic system. Um, they're not, uh, most of the ones I'm going to talk to you about, there's going to be three artists I'm going to talk to you about, and uh, two of them are not especially well-known or famous. I mean, they are famous on a level, but nothing like, you know, Britney Spears or, um, or like Madonna. But it's because they're working outside of this system. Um, the first artist I want to share with you is Holly Herndon. She's a San Francisco artist. And um, she just came out with a new album this past year. Um, and before I get into talking about this, I'm going to sort of backtrack for a second. Um, and I just want to uh, quickly uh, talk for a moment again about this sort of externalization of identity. Um, Joseph Campbell, as how he describes mythology, as he says, people say that what we are seeking is a meaning for life. He says, I don't think that's what we're seeking. I think what we are seeking is an experience of being alive so that the life experiences that we have on a purely physical plane will have resonances within, within that are those of our own innermost being and reality, so that we are actually feeling the rapture of being alive. That's what it's all finally about, and that's what these are clues to help us find within ourselves. And so I showed you a lot of images, and to be perfectly honest, the reason why I picked these images is because these are all images that, for me, I find really provocative and exciting and uh, imaginative, and I really see them having this potential to sort of create new ideas about the world. But it's because they're so externalized that to embody these identities is to have no experience of the sort of inner essence of the self. And uh, as Donna Haraway says in Simeon, Cyborgs, and Companion Species, um, as technology changes the world we live in, the dichotomies between the mind, body, animal, and human, primitive men and women, primitive and civilized, are all in question ideologically. The actual situation of women is their integration, exploitation into a world system of production, reproduction, and communication called the informatics of domination. The home, workplace, market, public arena, the body itself, all can be dispersed and interfaced in nearly infinite polymorphous ways with large consequences for women and others, consequences that themselves are very different for different people, and which make potent oppositional international movements difficult to imagine and essential for survival. Liberation rests on the construction of the consciousness, the imaginative apprehension of oppression and so of possibility. The cyborg is a matter of fiction and lived experience that changes what counts as women's experience in the late 20th century. This is a struggle over life and death, but the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. And with the work of Holly Herndon, the reason why I find it really inspiring is because she takes technology and really um, focuses it more on the creative act. So here, um, going back to these uh, different sort of cyber virtual identities, we can see in this video 
that she integrates animation and she has an animation of herself. But the video is so focused on the actual creation of the animation um, in the programming system that we become really aware of her as the creator of this image. And so she becomes sort of this, she takes on a more powerful role that she's the creator, she's the artist. In her video home, which is here, she uh, addresses um, the NSA and spying and the experience of being at home and feeling a presence that is watching you. So she uses pop music, or a kind of pop music, it's maybe more on the experimental side of pop music, um, to sort of engage with these ideas and bring these ideas to a larger population. I'm gonna play a bit of uh, her music so you guys can get a sense. And we see these are all uh, symbols of um, the NSA and different uh, entities which do spying in the United States that are raining down upon her. And the final video, and I definitely recommend you guys watching these more online when you're at home. And her last most recent video that just came out is um, called Morning Sun. And we see it here, um, and it's a vision of space in which she is the space explorer. So in all these other visions, we see women stripping in space, we see women being beautiful in space, but we never see them as the explorer, as the scientist, and this really offers that perspective. And um, I really appreciate her kind of um, integrating these sort of autonomous identities into this landscape. And as you go through the video, some things happen. She has a kind of encounter with other uh, life forms along the way. I'll just scroll quickly through. She has this kind of um, ghost-like experiences in her through technology. And when I saw her play in, in Berlin, it was such an amazing show because at the show she actually had uh, Jacob Applebaum, who is a who was one of the um, journalists who helped leak the Edward Snowden documents. She actually came, ha had him come up on stage and give, uh, say this political poem on stage. And it was really powerful. The whole show was super powerful and she's not afraid to be political. And these were the t-shirts she was wearing and selling at the show as well. Free Chelsea Manning, who's also another, as probably you know, uh, whistleblower who is currently incarcerated. So, another artist who I find really inspiring is uh, just going to get to my spot here. Moment of silence. There we go. Um, so this is Sputniko, and she is a British and Japanese artist. And she um, is started as a mathematician and as an engineer uh, and a designer, and she moved into making pop music. And um, so what she does is she invents um, these technological devices and then she makes pop uh, music videos and songs about these devices so that she can share her ideas with a larger audience. And in this particular video, she has created the Moonwalk machine, which is an actual machine she creates. And so the idea of this song is that there's a young girl who has this fantasy about Moon Girl 
and who's this sort of fictional character that she loves and identifies with. And she wants to be like Moon Girl, and she wants to go to the moon, but she feels like she can't actually do it. So, and this is kind of a parody of this idea, because uh, Sputnik sort of talks about how she really thinks women should go to the moon. But the next best thing would be have a machine which will put the footprints of women on the moon. Um, so this young teenage girl decides to invent this machine that puts female footprints on the moon. And while again we see this use of parody in creating the meaning of this mythic sort of tale, um, at the same time, the identity that's being conveyed is of this young teenage girl who's an inventor and she has a purpose and she goes for it and she's uh, able to create technological devices for her own purposes. And so in that way, I think it's a really uh, inspiring role model for a lot of kids. And for adults, for me too. I want to invent a machine to go to the moon. Um, and she said that her inspiration for this machine came from a young girl who was just 13 for her science project um, in which she sent Hello Kitty to space and create, rigged it up so that she could film Hello Kitty in space. And Sputniko thought this was so brilliant um, that this might be a possible future we could imagine is that young girls or young boys, teenagers, on their summer holidays for their summer science project create these amazing inventions that really are breakthroughs in technology. Uh, so we can see already how this integrates new ideas about the future, new future visions. But they're different, they're outside of these sort of like capitalistic, patriarchal visions. And while they might, they're not directly political, in a lot of ways, you know, they, they're really subversive and sort of like rethinking our possible futures. And the final artist I want to share, who I'm sure you all know, is Bjork. And um, I'm, there's a lot I could say about her work because I think she is one artist who really is able to integrate technology in really interesting ways and create these really powerful sort of female identities. Um, but I'm going to talk about biophilia specifically because this, I think, is a really interesting project. It's her first app um, created and, um, or oh, sorry, the first app album that's ever been created. And it's a series of songs and they're also um, educational. Each song um, has to do with nature and you go through the app and you learn about music and its connection to nature. And I think the really amazing thing about this is that not only is it educa education for young kids, but also, um, it uh, really has this sort of reverence for nature and sort of going back to seeing the connection between um, technology and nature that I think a lot of us forget. It's almost like nature is not a part of us, which in fact it's something that has developed alongside of us and something that you know we really need to um, integrate with nature so that we can find uh, positive ways to go into the future technologically. So this is the how the app looks itself, and you can see the little dots. Um, the the glowing ones are songs, and then when you hit on those, then you can go through a series of sort of educational things, educational exercises. And uh, during this um, tour, she also had. Uh, uh, it's coming up here. Let's see. They, uh, yeah, so she has this, um, uh, what do you call it again? Oh, Tesla coil. <laughs> Sorry, took me a second there. Uh, she has this tex Tesla coil that um, she plays along, and so it's kind of this integration of um, the sort of nature and technology as its own sort of voice within the music. And so this whole project and tour I found uh, 
really a, a beautiful project. And uh, she says that the reason she wanted to do this um, project is because she had a real concern for the environment and wanted to bring attention back uh, onto nature for young people. Um, this video, Moon, she says, um, which is part of the album, uh, is with each new moon, we complete a cycle and are offered renewal to take risks, to connect with other people, to love, to give. The symbolism of the moon as the realm of imagination, melancholy, and regeneration is expressed in the song. Um, so we see this kind of mythology that is really integrating this sort of uh, sense of identity with something deeper, sort of um, ethical or moral or spiritual as, as you'd like to interpret it. So I'm just going to end us off here with some nature songs, some nature sounds. Um, and to summarize, I would like to talk about um, the role of being an artist now and um, how we can sort of do this with, within this sort of landscape and sort of what, what um, gods or goddesses or spiritual beings we can connect with as a way to create work which really brings new concepts, um, new ideological concepts, new spiritual concepts as we move forward and uh, to find new future um, possibilities. And I really think for myself that this can be a struggle because as an artist, if you get too caught up in what you're trying to do, you can sort of lose this connection with a sort of a divine energy that flows through you in the act of creation. And I think as artists, anyone who's an artist or even anyone who's really passionate about something has felt this experience at one time or another. Um, and uh, Virginia Woolf in her essay, A Room of One's Own, uh, expresses this really well. Um, this, this notion of just continuing to create and not to worry too much. She says, I would ask you to write all kinds of books. Um, actually, I'm going to... Okay, so she says, so long as you write what you wish to write, that is all that matters, and whether it matters for ages or only for hours, no one can say. But to sacrifice a hair of the head of your vision, a shade of its color, in deference to some headmaster with a silver pot in his hand, or some professor with a measuring rod up his sleeve, is the most abject treachery, the sacrifice of wealth and chastity, which used to be said to be the greatest of human disasters, a mere flea bite in comparison. For the masterpieces are not singular and solitary births, they are an outcome of many years of thinking in common, of thinking by the body of the people, so that the experience of the mass is behind the single voice. So as artists, I think this is really something that we just need to create. You know, we need to be conscious creators and really sort of get in touch with ourselves on a deeper level, because when we connect with ourselves, we really connect with the world, and it opens up all kinds of new possibilities. And I'm going to leave you off with... a birth myth of the goddess Saraswati, who could potentially be a goddess that we could all look to for divine creative energy. Um, she is a Hindu goddess, and uh, she's often de depicted, you can see her here, um, as a beautiful woman dressed in pure white, often seated on a white lotus, which symbolizes light, knowledge, and truth. She not only embodies knowledge, but also the experience of the highest reality. She is generally shown to have four arms rep representing one, the mind sense, two, the intellect and reasoning, three, the imagination and creativity, and four, the self-consciousness and ego. And so the story of the birth of Saraswati. In the beginning, there was chaos. Everything existed in formless fluid state. How do I bring order to this disorder, wondered Brahma, the creator? 
With knowledge, said Devi. Heralded by a peacock, sacred books in one hand and a vena in the other, dressed in white, Devi emerged from Brahma's mouth, riding a swan as the goddess Saraswati. Knowledge helps man find the possibility where once he saw problems, said the goddess. Under her tutelage, Brahma acquired the ability to sense, think, comprehend, and communicate. He began looking upon chaos with the eyes of wisdom and thus saw beautiful potential that lay there, there within. Brahma discovered the melody of mantras in the cacophony of chaos. In his joy, he named Saraswati Vagdevi, goddess of speech and sound. The sound of mantras filled the universe with vital energy or prana. Things began to take shape and the cosmos acquired a structure. The sky dotted with stars rose to the form of heavens. The sea sank into the abyss below. The earth stood in between. Gods became lords of the celestial spheres. Demons ruled the nether regions. Humans walked on earth. The sun rose and set. The moon waxed and waned. The tide flowed and ebbed. Seasons changed. Seeds germinated, plants bloomed and withered, animals migrated and reproduced at ra as randomness gave way to the rhythm of life. Thank you. If you guys have questions and you want to take a moment, we can discuss. Thank you so much for... Uh, having patience and um, listening and being here with me today. I appreciate it. Hi. I see lots of friendly faces here. It's awesome. Or we can... Okay, go ahead. Um, I just had a, a thought comment. Maybe you could react to it. Um, I remember having a long, drunken argument, discussion, in a good way with some friends. And um, it was in reaction to some graffiti which said, uh, I think it was Liber um, uh, Cyborg aus Godin, which is like rather the cyborg than the goddess. And uh, I, yeah, yeah. And, um, this is a Donna Haraway quote, yeah. Right. I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. So That's the, yeah. Do you want to comment in that? Because it seemed to me like you went the other way around. Because you ended with the goddess. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I love Donna Haraway. She's one of my greatest inspirations. But um, I think the thing with that text, um, the Cyborg Manifesto, is that in theory it's really amazing and powerful piece of writing or of possibility. But unfortunately, the idea of the cyborg is something which uh, she sees as sort of this untouched possibility of, of a being, of an identity. But unfortunately, it is something that is touched, it is already manipulated, and our concept of it is already part in many ways shaped. And it's something that um, we can take this notion, her notion of the cyborg, I think, as something which exists out of sort of these defined identities and is able to sort of cross borders. And we can take this notion and really run with it. And I think the notion itself is beautiful. But to really think about the cyborg in this sense, it is something which has been defined um, historically. And a lot of its associations um, are really negative. And it's not the fault of the cyborg. <laughs> It's just um, that it's already had a real history in terms of the stories that have been told around it. So um, in the context of her essay, I get why she's saying I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess, because she's sort of referring to feminism, which uh, defines the idea of what femininity is. Like we're from nature, we're connected to nature, women are different than men, and these sort of like def definitions. And I think that's really what she means by that phrase. And she means to be a cyborg is to exist outside of these defined sort of uh, spaces. But I, I think you could be a goddess that exists outside of these defined spaces as well and kind of, you know, embrace that, her theory. Um, I guess it's just whatever uh, archetype you choose to embrace so long as it's done so with, uh, with an openness to new possibilities. Uh, 
Hi, I had a question about the first uh, selection of, I guess, popular music stars that you showed. Mm -hmm. And you said you selected those, uh, those people, famous people, uh, because their imagery and their projects sort of excite, excite you and your sensibility. Um, but in some ways, that imagery is, is also a little disturbing. Oh, absolutely. In, in that every one of those women has had body modification, yes. the most extreme of which is the Barbie, living Barbie. Yeah. So I wonder about your thoughts. Um, yeah, OK. Well, actually, um, so as I mentioned before, this lecture is sort of an ongoing thing. And there's many elements to it. And I'm really trying to keep it down to a shorter um, sort of amount of time just to get through things so that we can have these sort of chats at the end. Um, but so this idea of plastic surgery is something that is um, in here. It's just something that I wasn't able to really spend as much time. So I'm really, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I think that this is the dark side of this imagery. And I think for me, my saying that it's, um, imagery or people that I'm interested in them, it's like, it's like eye candy, you know? It's so beautiful and enticing and um, exciting, and it sort of speaks to something, sort of this uh, child self that, you know, wants to touch something shiny. And, and I feel that. And also, uh, as a woman, you know, I, I also feel this sense of uh, beauty and this sort of um, intoxicating kind of draw or desire towards beauty and the beautiful, the image of the beautiful woman, um, but it is um, it is really destructive and um, dangerous, and I think that's something that we have to realize and really put forth. And um, people are scared to talk about it because it's a really controversial issue, because. Plastic surgery is the choice of the woman and her body or whoever, right? And their body and their own identity and how they want to express themselves. But we have to realize that this kind of body, this image of the body, is really pushed on women to such a degree that, you know, it becomes what you should have. It becomes, like, the only way to really be a proper woman. In some cultures, it's, like, really acceptable um, to do that. And... In Japan, there's a big problem, even with the kawaii, which is uh, really, I mean, I didn't touch on this before, but it sort of was uh, kawaii kind of emerged, emerged in this sort of post-Hiroshima culture, uh, wanting to um, create this sort of like lightheartedness and uh, sort of fun energy within the culture. So it started as this beautiful thing, and it is still beautiful in some ways, but now, because of all the images, young women are getting um, their eyelids surgically altered, so they have bigger eyes, they're getting nose jobs, and most dangerous of all, they're getting uh, chin, reconstructive chin surgery, which is the most dangerous to make your face small and pointed, um, like an anime character. And this can actually create like your whole, like in about 60% of patients, your whole face will go numb. Some people have had, uh, they can't stop drooling, they can't feel when they're drooling. Um, and all kinds of horrible things. And there's even been suicides after the surgery because it's so horrible. And it's a really dark thing to talk about in its, its own, um, uh, there's so much you could say about it. And it's, it's really a sad thing. But I do think, I'm really glad you brought it up because it is an important thing to recognize that these are harmful uh, identities, that they're dangerous. And that by, you know, promoting these in such an extreme way, it is really um, a form of, like, really deep-seated oppression and misogyny. And um, actually, there's a quote by, uh, by Naomi Wolf where she says that, um, that beauty is the best and last um, sort of... Uh, uh, tool for misogyny. I'm getting the quote wrong here, but uh, I think it's really true because um, in the end, we even have in pop music and pop culture people that are feminists and are like outright about being a feminist. And this is another controversial issue: like, are they feminists? Are they not? Women have a right to be sexual um, and say that they're feminists. They have that right, but 
the only image we see within mainstream media is sexy, beautiful women conforming to this beauty standard and with lots of plastic surgery very often, who, and that's the identity of strength. You know, and we need new identities of strength, and we need new identities of beauty, and it has to also be something that's internal and not just external, because you can't live a beautiful life and experience a beautiful life if you're in horrible pain because you've surgically altered your body, and it's, it's um, yeah, it's absolutely uh, horrible, so I appreciate you bringing that up, <laughs> yeah. Um, as far as I remember, I read the Cyborg Manifesto a long time ago, but um, Donna Haraway has some point that she makes about noise as being a disruptive mode within, um, I think she's referring to the communication system, but have you thought about noise as a counterpoint in music as sort of a subversive strategy? Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess I used to be really into noise music, and um, I do appreciate that form, and I still like noise music to a degree, but I also think at this point right in my life right now that I'm really learning to appreciate silence in a way that I probably have never before. Um, and because over the past few years, I've started meditating more, and taking a moment of silence, I feel like really allows for this kind of clarity and this sort of being able to hear and see because I think I mean I again like I love Donna Haraway's work but um, I think we're so saturated with noise and information all the time that silence has actually become this sort of really rare thing um, whereas noise is almost like the default would you yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, so if, I mean, if anyone has any more questions, but otherwise we could um, have some snacks and drinks and we can chat more. The bar is open until 10.30. So. Okay, thanks so much. Okay.